Well, yeah, as I try and get this pulled up, um, so some of the first nice weather here as well. So, yeah, my name's Dylan Bruce, um, and my wife, Sky Bruce, is also on the call here, but is currently traveling, so we're on separate Zooms. Um, but we started Circadian Organics in 2018 um, for the first four or five years. We were mostly a CSA. Um, a little bit about our farm. We're in southwest Wisconsin. Um, that's hardiness zone 4A to 4B, depending on if we're in the valley or on the ridge. It gets a lot colder in the valleys. Um, it's hilly country. And on the hilltops, we have kind of a pretty dense clay loam. And in the valley, it's more of a sandy silt loam. Um, on our farm, we have about 45 acres of conventional cropland that's rented out, about 15 acres in organic hay, which gives us some nice rotation room. Um, and then we are doing four acres of organic vegetable and flower seed. Um, and we have four 100 foot cat caterpillar tunnels, but we don't have any um, proper high tunnels per se. Um, and when we were doing our CSA for the first five years, we were more at kind of fluctuating between three quarters and an acre and a half. So a bit smaller scale. And then we made the decision last production season in 2023 to move all to um, seed production or pretty much exclusively seed production and with that we were able to expand a bit um sort of how we operate we have a 68 horsepower tractor uh that we purchased in 2022 um and before that we were renting a 54 horsepower kubota which you see in the bottom right we do use a, a six foot tractor mounted rotavator but we also use a bcs tiller we have kind of an antique um, grain drill that we use for um, planting cover crops um, on a medium scale. We build semi-permanent raised beds using using a uh, Nolts raised bed mulch layer, not a mechanical transplanter, actually. We use a quack digger that's an integral part of our field uh, establishment to get rid of quack grass. And then we have a sort of rear discharge hand mower, which is important for managing our um, living aisles. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we broad fork our beds as well. So I think, you know, probably your, your folks are well familiar with the reasons to cover crop. You're in a pretty different climate in some ways up there. I think not when I was looking it up, not too different in the num amount of like growing days you have but it seems like it's overall quite drier um and where we are we get about and pardon me because i don't know the metric conversion but we get about um 40 inches of rainfall annually is our uh, average um and so a primary motivation for us with cover cropping is water management um you know you can see in the picture on the left how even a just few week old cover crop can really help stop erosion and rilling. And, um, and then we get some pretty extreme flooding events every so often. So that that's really what inspired us to reduce tillage initially, but there's of course a lot of other benefits. Um, and, uh, the, you know, some of those might include um, weed smothering um just keeping the the soil covered to feed the microbes as well not just for erosion reduction fixing or scavenging nutrients um for your subsequent cash crops um and you know uh, uh, uh in interrupting cycles and i think of that both in terms of like pests diseases and um uh and weed life cycles so I'll start by talking a little bit about our living mulch. So as folks probably know, living mulch just basically means having some living cover, some plants. Um, and uh, I think the, the the easiest place to start with living mulch is in the aisles in between your cash crop. And then you can also, um, you know, some people grow planting directly into white clover or, or things like that, you know, um, interceding with their cash crop. 
And basically your goal here is, is weed suppression, but, but there's other benefits as well. Of course, reducing erosion. One of my favorites is that um, as compared to a bare dirt, bare soil pathway, it's much easier to work after rain. It also dries out the soil quicker because of the transpiration and it maintains um, beneficial populations, whether that's providing habitat for things like um, lace wings or, or uh, lady beetles because they can feed on aphids that are in that cover crop or um, maintaining our muscular mycorrhizal associations and, and populations. Um, so I think, you know, the, probably the most common um, uh, uh, living mulch is Dutch white clover, but we use um, a, a variety of mixes that I, I have a slide on. I think the, the keys to success with really any cover crop, um, but starting with living mulch is you have to treat it seriously, um, like a, you know, almost like a cash crop if, if you want it to do something for you. And, and that's really the, the place to start with cover cropping is what's your goal. So again, for us, it's, it's primary goal of water management, secondary goal of, you know, nutrient management and, and a tertiary goal of um, keeping those beneficial populations and just kind of a more diverse ecology. But it's really important to, to understand what you want there because that's going to determine your species selection. And then that'll help determine, you know, when are you establishing that cover crop? And that timing is very important to play around with in terms of dis disrupting pest disease and weed cycles. Um, so if you, you know, if, if like, for instance, for us, we plant a lot of our crops around June 1st, that's includes squash and cucurbits and the solanaceous crops and any warm season crop. It's like, that's kind of our target planting date. And so a big chunk of our field acreage, we are, you know, doing prep on and, um, and have the cash crop growing kind of in a similar time frame. But if we want to, you know, if we, if we just operate with just those crops year after year, it's going to select for weeds that um, are, are warm season annuals that can, you know, wait until um, after our cultivation is done to establish, or it'll select for winter annuals at the end of our cash cropping cycle that can then get in the way in the in the spring and so you can disrupt those cycles by say planting a cover crop um, very early spring or by planting a cover crop um, midsummer so kind of getting offbeat of when your cash crops are established and then you have to think about how are you going to manage that competition between your cover crop and your cash crop if it's integrated like in the case of living mulch or crimped rye and that means knowing what your termination method is going to be if you need to kill that cover crop or how you're going to limit the competition and how we do that with living mulch is by keeping it mowed regularly so that it doesn't disrupt airflow too much um, when we are mowing the tops off those cover crops are going to shed a sort of correlated or a certain amount of their root biomass as well so it prevents them from just getting too vigorous and and competing for nutrients and things and and water um and this is where I, i'd mentioned that that rear discharge hand mower is important um because you don't want to spray all that grass residue from your aisles onto your cash crop it can cause diseases and and cause issues there so um either mulching or rear discharge is good. And if you're using a mulching mower, it just means you have to really stay on top of it um, because, you know, it can't chew through too much material at once, but it is um, nice because, you know, these small push mowers are pretty accessible, right? You can find them used and, and they're not too bad to fix and stuff. Um, and then I, I like this picture of the Dutch white clover because um, it shows that you know, you really have you really have to know your your weeds or your issues that you're dealing with before you um, choose your your species because what you see here is a lot of um, crabgrass that's mixed in with the Dutch white clover and setting a lot of seeds still and obviously that's not good. We don't want crabgrass is is you know a, a bad weed for us and what happened in this case is that 
the crabgrass is able to set seed at the same height as the Dutch white clover is growing. And so we can't really mow low enough to manage it versus something like a broadleaf, like a lamb's quarters or an amaranthus species. Um, its growth habit is going to be a lot easier to, to manage with mowing. So yeah, just knowing your system and your goals is really important. Um, you know, I, I can share, share this, uh, so that people can, uh, well, I guess you have the recording going so that people can look at this kind of stuff, but we've been experimenting with some different mixes. Our kind of standard mix is annual and perennial ryegrass, red fescue, Dutch white clover, and crimson clover. And that's what we've used for, for you know, quite a while. And um, it's super quick out the gate, just really weed competitive. Um, it's nice because the you, you get some flowering in there to attract beneficials, but the 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 red fescue and particularly the Dutch white clover can get um, pretty aggressive at the edges of beds over time. And the the crimson clover and the annual ryegrass die out, you know, where we're at, we get maybe 18% or 20% in some studies I've seen that over winters, but mostly it dies out. And so we've been experimenting with some different mixes. And I think this is nice. This is like a, a, um, a month and a half after seeding. And you can really see that like the chewing fescue and the micro clover, which is a, just a um, trademarked cultivar of Dutch white clover that's not as aggressive, is just not doing its job, right? It's There's so many weeds in there. Um, it's totally overwhelmed and they're going to get smothered out. And um, the way I should have put pictures in from this spring, but, you know, it's pretty sparse in there, what the, wow. the chewing fescue and micro clover that actually survived. And then um, I really like this mix of Italian ryegrass and crimson clover and Dutch white clover. Um, the the crimson clover does die out a little bit, but the Italian ryegrass is a it's a perennial ryegrass, but it's a cultivar that doesn't head as um, as much, and so it's got just much more foliage growth over the course of the season, um, and it doesn't yeah it doesn't kill from mowing quite as easily, um, and you know still at the edges of the beds, which are always a challenging zone. Um, you know, it's pretty weedy, but that one really shaped up nicely. And then this mix of Italian ryegrass, chewing fescue, crimson clover, and micro clover also did super well and looks really good this spring. Um, and in our system, you know, we look at reducing tillage um, also through rotating the tillage. And, um, you know, that's an opportunity for us to add baseline nutrients like phosphorus and potassium that that um, need to be more incorporated into the soil to 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 really in terms of or certified organic amendments to really become available, um, especially the soft rock phosphate. Um, and so we can get that in there and then establish new fields, really get a clean start. We do that for any, you know, direct seeded, especially early crops like carrots and beets and radishes and stuff like that. And then um, we'll use those beds for about three years. And so on the left side here is a second year picture of um, some, some beds where we had done a good job of establishing that living mulch in the aisles. And so the first year we used plastic there predominantly in between. And then we took that up and are able to just staple in our landscape fabric and reuse those beds. And so it keeps that permanent cover in between Yeah. So again, the, you know, just getting that good establishment is really important. Um, and you don't have to do that with a big 12 foot or larger grain drill, right? You can, you can do that on a small market garden scale, but I would say that, um, you know, you can't like, you, you don't want to just, uh, toss some seed out on the soil surface at the end of the season. Um, after removing your cash crop, it's really late. There's not many growing degree days left. And you're just tossing it out there and expecting it to germinate, you know, that can work to a certain extent to give a little bit of soil cover through the winter, but um, you're not going to get a really vibrant cover crop. And, and for that, I would say um, what's worked best for us is having nice soil tilth. So either right when we remove our plastic or landscape fabric or other mulches in the spring and um, over winter, the soil is mellowed and is really nice underneath there and um or 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 tillage and then for some species like um 
oats, rye, peas, stuff that wants to be quite a bit deeper in the soil, like a, you know, at least a half inch, an inch deep. Um, tilling it in can work pretty well as a way to incorporate it, but you can also just rake it in. And then, you know, yeah, there are antique grain drills you can find around or using an earthway or cedar or a jank se push cedar, you know, one of those push cedars if you have it. And if you've just got a 30 inch bed top, only takes a few passes to to get enough coverage on that bed top. Um, but I wanted to show on the right here an example of, of poor establishment. You can see that we had tried to get some oats and peas going in this tunnel, and especially at the edge, um, it's just very sparse um, and and not as as much coverage as we would have wanted to see there. And in that because in that case. Our goal with that cover crop was smothering weeds, which it's definitely not doing well, and fixing nitrogen, which the percentage of legumes in that stand is far too low to be effective at that, especially at that stage of of um, development for the oats as as things move into flower and setting seed, they come become more carbon heavy. You know, if those oats were just a foot high and lush green growth, like we're seeing in this ryegrass here on the left, that's good you know, breaks down into pretty readily available nitrogen, but not where those oats are at. Um, and then, you know, another big primary goal for, for cover cropping is, of course, weed competition. And there's a lot of different ways to, to slice this. Um, you know, we love rye. I think cereal rye is like a easy place to start for um, cover cropping. It's extremely competitive. It's fairly easy to establish and, and has a lot better cold weather vigor. And so you can kind of work around your, I mean, in, on market farms, we just have tight windows, right? There's not a lot of, there's a lot of quick bed flips and not necessarily an abundance of space. And so you got to be able to get it in when you can say you're, you're, you know, taking off your late season brassicas right before winter or something. And as you're doing your final harvest, you just scatter some rye seed on the surface. It'll probably germinate and, and have something in the next spring. Or, you know, if you're going to pull out those plants and let that soil disturbance be what partially incorporates the seed, um, rye is a fairly easy one um, to, to work with. And it's got, you know, probably folks know the property called allelopathy, where it's actually exuding some chemicals through the roots, primarily at this younger stage, like when it's this age and less physically competitive, um, but also, you know, up until it's terminated, really. Um, so we, we do use crimped rye a little bit, and I would encourage folks to consider that for cucurbit crops or, or brassicas. Um, you do need to use supplementary fertilization because it's so competitive for nutrients. Um, but especially for crimp, crimped rye, the establishment and timing is so important. If your goal is just some living roots in there over winter, you can just scatter the seed. Like I was saying, just kind of give it in there a little haphazardly, rake it in just lightly. If you're trying to grow a stand of rye that can be crimped, you must have really good establishment and it needs to have a lot of tillering and like basically look like this in the fall. This is, this is pictures from this spring. You can, I was trying to use my hand to illustrate the size, which probably didn't work very well, but um, you know, any smaller than this really, I would not consider it a suitable stand for crimping. So you can kind of see in the side shot with this little, we had a small plot of some rare corn that we did here and, it didn't establish as nicely. So on kind of the right side of that picture, you can see that's a thinner stand of rye versus on the left on, on that, that right stand of rye is like fine for just taking care of the soil a little bit, but would not have the weed competition necessary for crimping. Whereas on the left that, that would, and about this time of year is also when I would recommend, or certainly by May 1st in our, where in our growing zone, um, was you know and i guess in terms of size of the rye like you really don't want to be terminating rye before a cash crop larger than about a foot in size if you can avoid it because it just gets so tenacious and is really difficult especially with like 
walk behind tractors and smaller equipment is really difficult to terminate. Um, so just, you know, stay on top of that. Um, and then again, you know, balancing the competition. So how, you know, how are you going to, um, make sure that the rye isn't stealing too many nutrients from your, uh, your cash crop. So here's another look at that. That's kind of like the tilth that I would want to be planting into, um, on the top left, you maybe, I don't know if you can see it, but there's quite a density of, of rye seed that I'm tilling in. Um, we use about 160 pounds, which is like three and a half, four bushels per acre, um, for our crimping rye versus if it's just for a cover crop, we're going to be at like half of that rate. Um, if it's just, if it's just for coverage and then you want to terminate it at anthesis, which is when all the little anthers are out and dropping pollen in between there and the soft dough stage, if you terminate it too late, you're going to end up with a lot of sprouting, um, and, um, too early, it'll just bounce back and tiller and gr grow new growth and will be hard to kill. Here's another look at on the top, right at like, what's kind of a suitable crimpable stand of rye. And um, there's a design from the USDA um, small farm engineering lab for a walk behind crimper, which is pretty sweet. And um, I would encourage folks to look up the group climate resilient organic vegetable production. And they have one of these in our neck of the woods and could also connect you with um, that engineer to get plans to build one for your farm. Um, and it's, you know, not too bad to, to, to have fabric if you have welding skills it's just the cost of the metal really um we mostly transplant into rye and it's it's you know kind of a pain um here you can see sky transplanting some cucumbers we had to actually shovel into there um and so you're trading kind of upfront labor for weed control labor later in the season and some things can do well direct seed seeded <clears throat> excuse me But uh, we've noticed a lot of varietal differences in performance in crimp dry systems. Um, and it seems like cucurbits that have adventitious rooting, especially maximas and um, some machadas are gonna do a lot better. Things that have vigorous vines, things that are gonna close canopy effectively, um, you know, maybe tighten up your spacing a little bit because as this breaks down over the course of the season, you want that canopy coming in. And then, yeah, we put on um, about uh, 40 extra pounds of nitrogen per acre for um, our crimped rye crops, um, which is just based on a like, as, as, as good as I could get my calculation looking at nitrogen removal rates from rye straw. And so um, that definitely helps the stunting some, but not for all crops or varieties. Sky, feel free to, to jump in if, if there's anything you think of that I'm not saying. One thing I love is that this, this rye um, and really any, can, any cover crop, but um, the, the dead rye straw is, is an incredible habitat for insects. And in the first year of establishment, that can be a, a good and bad. Um, we have squash bugs here pretty regularly and they love having residue to hide in. Uh, maybe you've seen them hiding under black plastic mulch. So they'll go in the holes and hide there. They like to hide in, in the rye straw. Um, but that rye straw, at, you know, after a little longer, the predatory insect species will come in as well. They take a little longer to move in than the pests, but then you get a lot of spiders living in there. You get snakes, um, so it's it's cool. I always jump about three feet in the air when the, we see the snakes, but they're they're good, <laughs> good to have. Um, so yeah, this is just a a look at uh th that crop later on. You know, pretty clean. Um, it it, it did pretty well. Um, and you can see in the background, kind of in between the the hemp and the um, squash, um, and in between the, the peppers and squash here that, you know, that's where the weeds come in more is, is where we're not getting that canopy over it early enough. I really like reusing those areas. It's just amazing for soil tilth. If you can avoid tilling it and, 
um, will either staple landscape fabric over it. Um, and it just is the most, even like a what should have been a dense clay like this middle picture, just the most crumbly, friable soil. Um, really incredible. You can transplant into it super easily. Um, on the on the right here is is um, no till green garlic for bunching for our early CSA, and then um, a small safflower seed crop that we planted into um, what had been a um, a crimped rye area. Um, and then, yeah, there's there's a lot of other options that are good for for um, weed suppression in cover crops. I think um, one of my favorites is buckwheat. I think this is nice on a market farm because it grows pretty quickly. And so you can get some solid growth even in a pretty small window. Again, if you're if you're, you know, tight on your rotation and, and don't have a lot of opportunities to integrate cover cropping. If you have even a month um, in warm weather, buckwheat is really awesome. It's really can be can be really good for dealing with um, Canada thistle or um, quack grass or other uh, weeds that grow rhizomatically because um, you can do like two or three successions of buckwheat in a year. And so you'll get tillage that's knocking that um, weed back and then um, direct like nutrient water and light competition from the buckwheat and then you mow it down till it again plant another round and so you're getting it's kind of like having a stale seed bedding um and and like full fallow cycle but with a cover crop in there pollinators love it, it doesn't smell the best necessarily in my opinion um and then you do have to be careful especially with like vns uh, variety not stated um, seed sources of buckwheat can have quite a high rate of hard seed. So you just want to make sure that when it gets to this flowering stage, you terminate it and you don't let it set seed. Um, yeah. And then, you know, I think another nice opportunity with cover crops and, and when we're thinking about disrupting these cycles of um, pests, diseases, and weeds is that you can get a completely different family in rotation. So um, you know, you can get grass family in there, which, which a lot of us, unless we're growing some sweet corn or something, we don't necessarily have, um, you can, you can get the, the, the buckwheat family in there. Um, you know, it's, it's just a good opportunity to introduce something that, that might not carry, uh, some of the, or might be resistant to some of the diseases you're dealing with and might not be a host for the pest, but will be a host for a more generalist, um predator population um so i i know like one of sky's friends that did some research showed that um for maintaining ladybug populations it's crucial to have small grains in the area or or, or winter crops because the aphid populations that will be on them at a time when other stuff isn't growing um are what sustains the ladybugs to then move back over to your kind of primary cash crop or whatever um and Sky, I don't know if I just butchered the explanation of that research, but yeah. Um, yeah, again, thinking about the time of your planting, are you, are you going to be able to use a warm season cover crop, cool season cover crop? Um, uh, uh, sorghum sedan grass and buckwheat are both great warm season. Sorghum sedan grass, especially mixed with cow peas, can is just put on an incredible amount of biomass um during two or three warm months and is really good for smothering things and then um, um oats and field peas is a favorite for us in the early season and um you know again like far earlier than we'd be planting almost any like a month before we're planting any even early spring um vegetables we can get the oats and peas out there and uh and then in the in the fall um doing uh, uh primarily cereal rye primarily winter rye is what we're doing in the fall uh, you know i know there's a lot of um attention or has been on like tillage radish or other brassica cover crops that can be biofumigants if you're dealing with certain um diseases or, or nematode pests when you till them in and can also break up soil compaction i i would definitely caution 
vegetable growers to use brassica cover crops because they can be a host for black rot or um, cabbage loopers or other, you know, coal crops are just um, important for our, for our diversified market farmers. And so it's, it's, it, I, I would personally avoid that or purchase from a source like from Washington state or a company like high mowing or so, so somebody in Canada that is, is providing documentation of disease testing for those seed lots. Sky, do you want to add anything about um, kind of be beneficials and, and insects and cover crops? Yeah, you mostly covered it. Uh, I was just making sure um, you didn't miss anything, but it, it sounds like you got it all. I mean, I love buckwheat because of how good it is for pollinators. I mean, bees love it. Butterflies love it. We have tons of pictures of, of pollinators on our buckwheat. Um, and it's just so quick. It flowers so quickly. Um, so you can have a huge stand of flowers to support um, uh, beneficial pollinator populations there in short order. Um, also, if people have honeybees, uh, it can be a great source of um, nectar for them and, and pollination. So um, yeah, I think you mostly covered it, but um, it's just really a, a lot of different pollinators really, really like buckwheat, especially. Um, and it's one of the only cover crops that we use, correct me if I'm wrong, Dylan, that does flower in abundance like this uh, and is so prolific for pollinators. So um, yeah, big fan of buckwheat for a number of reasons. Um, um, and then, you know, once you have other, you have a, um, an area that is habitat for pollinators, it brings in other beneficials to uh, predatory insects in particular. So. Um, it's good for building not only predatory or not only pollinator uh, populations, but also predatory insects uh, up on the farm. Um, but yeah, just important that you terminate it um, shortly after it gets to this flowering stage um, and then keep the rotation going and maybe have a, another stand of buckwheat on the come up somewhere else on the farm. Yeah, when we've uh, been dealing with areas that had bad Canada thistle in it, like that was definitely one of our go-tos is, is, you know, till, leave it fallow for a week, um, let the Canada thistle start to come back up uh, and dry out, hit it again, um, plant the buckwheat, let the buckwheat grow, terminate that till, week in between, till again, plant buckwheat, and that worked just superbly. And then we've also had, you know, done basically the same exact, thing with uh sorghum sedan grass except for it's not multiple successions it's multiple mowings um because if you mow the canada thistle at um you know at the bud stage it's pretty effective at, at killing it and um so if you get it you know if you can get that sorghum sedan grass established it's going to smother and then um you know mow it down right at, right at that bud stage of the thistle um and then one of the other functionalities I was mentioning for cover crops is to fix and scavenge nutrients. Um, there's a, a, a farmer in our community in Southeast Wisconsin who uses oats and peas very successfully in his corn before his corn crops and, and claimed to um, be able to produce 120 pounds of nitrogen per acre. That was his offset with, uh, with the, you know, lush growth, kind of similar to what's in our tunnel here on this left-hand picture. I was like, when I heard that, I was like, no way, there's no way anybody can make, grow that much nitrogen with peas and, and oats mixed. And, um, but you know, we, we did that as well. We generally give our peppers about 60 pounds of nitrogen, um, for most, um, of our, of our pepper types. And so what we basically did is, you know, I, I, so we, we had, um, tilled this with the BCS raked in this oat and pea seed um in early march just really early and then this is this picture is taken um right at the end of may so after a couple months of growth um i believe i did even water this once to help speed up the establishment and then it's about two and a half feet high in this picture i took an empty barrel i rolled it down so i wasn't crimping it per se it wouldn't crimp well at this vegetative stage anyways rolled it down and then we just hand laid some black plastic over it to um smother it 
And the amount of biological activity under there was insane. I mean, it just heated up like a ton from both the composting of that super nice, um, tender vegetative green material, as well as the, the solar and occultation effect. Um, and we ended up giving these peppers really bad nitrogen shock. There had been so, there was so much nitrogen, no other fertilizer went on, but, um, a lot of our, especially our hot peppers, um, just showed symptoms of nitrogen shock. So, uh, and, and, you know, you know, compared to, um, when we used to give our peppers like a hundred pounds of nitrogen per acre and they'd be just fine. So yeah, I think we were like almost in that 120 pound range, which is like, if you think about that on a farm scale, and if, if you're, if a lot of your primary, um, cash crops are those warm season crops, you can save a lot on your fertilizer if you can get that in in time and get that lush growth. Um, of course, it's a little bit more of a gamble and you can't fix phosphorus and potassium and other secondary nutrients. But um, yeah, we've continued to do this and, and use this mix. And, um, you know, I, I we, we haven't um, had to worry about that much nitrogen uh, since then, but um, definitely for like our um, squash or cucurbits and our, and our peppers, we can grow all the nitrogen we need. Let's see. Oh, am I at the end there? Or is my computer just having trouble? It's one second here. Yeah, well, um, I guess I am somehow missing my last final slide that was a thank you and questions, but um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I had hoped to be able to chat with folks and, and you know, kind of troubleshoot. And I love talking about cover crops and um, through working at the University of Wisconsin and, and researching there. And then on our own farm, I've had the opportunity to try out a lot of different combinations and for different goals. And um, so I, you know, I would, I would welcome folks to, to contact me too and um, shoot me an email and, and just spitball ideas of like, Hey, I've got this gap in my rotation or I've got this weed or pest that we're dealing with or this disease. Um, and yeah, let's fig you figure out how to get cover crops in on your farm. I think, you know, it, it can feel intimidating, but um, with a rake, uh, a hand, you know, walk behind tiller, something like that, you can establish it pretty easily. Cover crop seed is pretty affordable. Um, you don't need to buy named varieties, in my opinion. You can you can use any VNS seed and it'll, it'll do a good job. Um, and then I, I would also just add a note of caution of like, um, cover crops are kind of having or or have been having their their sort of fad moment as well and they're they're in vogue and people will try and sell you a lot of things with cover cropping and and mixes that have you know 20 different species in them and are really expensive for the seed and and you don't really need that you know i think um there's some great research out of the university of pennsylvania looking at um trade-offs and cover cropping and so you'll a lot of times have have trade-offs and if you're trying to fix nitrogen uh, you might not be as effective on weed suppression if you're trying to have really effective weed suppression you might not be as effective on um, fixing nitrogen um, etc or, or you know um, the the buckwheat is is a short season cover crop but it gives you that flowering period other longer season cover crops might not give that flowering to boost um, the pollinator populations so there are trade-offs and you just have to decide what your goals are and work within that scope and yeah, don't get oversold by, by a seed company. Um, if you, if you put vetch or field peas in with your rye, it is not going to make up for the nitrogen drawdown by the rye. Like you, you you'll still have to use extra nitrogen or the system will still be starved of nitrogen after that rye crop is terminated. Um, and you know, it's nice to have that diversity in there and it can also be challenging. The, the, um, pod set timing of when you crimp vetch is, does not usually line up with the anthesis timing of when you crimp 
rise. So it's just these these trade offs that's important for th- uh, for people to consider. And so yeah, there's some great papers out of the University of Pennsylvania um, that that can help with that kind of guidance of, of figuring out depending on what your goals are the like two to three species mix that might do the job for you rather than having to like spring for the, you know pay, foot the bill for a dozen species in a mix um but also no shade on people that choose to go that route right like we, we all know a diverse system can be more resilient and in our living aisles that's why we include multiple grass types and and multiple clovers is because they fill different niches so um yeah encourage folks to play around with it um for the cost of a bag of oat seed compared to most of your inputs on a market farm in, in a year, that's it's so negligible. And uh, it, it, there's also a kind of less, um, less economic, but, but uh, you know, a, a big reason for us cover cropping is we want it to be green out there. And, and we like the living aisles because it's just, even though they have their challenges in terms of creeping onto the edges of beds and, you know, taking time to mow and manage them. I just like it better than bare dirt. Like, you know, it's, it's more difficult. It's probably less profitable because it competes with our crop. It's, you know, in some ways, but like, it's just so much more pleasant for me to work on. And that matters a lot, I think. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if do either of you or, or your guests there have any questions or comments or Thanks so much, Dylan. Um, I don't think we we might have a few, but I'll summarize that if anyone's watching this recording after the date, to email anyone at MOA directly, and I can send your contact over to them um, to do some of that questions and, and brainstorming. Thank you so much for the offer. Um, so with that, I'll say thank you, and I'll stop the recording.